Hi, and welcome again to the eLearn program brought to you by the Division of Education, Innovation and Energy. My name is Mr. Thomas, and I will be teaching you organic chemistry. So, last day, we would have looked at naming compounds. So let's take a little recap on what we would have done. One, we would have learned about naming organic compounds. All right, in that we would have need, known, learned that we would need the organic prefix. Um, that would be meth, et, prop, but, pent, hex, as it goes on and on, in order for us to name organic compounds. We would have looked at types of formulas. So we would have looked at the molecular formula. We would have looked at the condensed formula. We would have looked at the structural formula. We would have even introduced what we call the skeleton or the line structure as well. We would have also looked at structural isomerism. That's basically an organic compound or organic compounds that have the same molecular formula but different structures. All right, we would have learned about the alkenes, the isomers of alkenes. We would have learned to draw isomers of alkenes. We would have also learned at naming alkane isomers. And from everything that we would have gathered in the last topic, we would have looked at practicing problems that would enable you to be able to be sharp for your exams. All right, so what are we going to do today? Today I'm excited. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to continue on the same trend in terms of naming organic compounds. Because we named alkenes, of course, who is going to be next? That's where my interest is concerned. All right, so today what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at naming and drawing A-L-K-E-N-E-S alkenes. All right, so we're going to be looking at this today. So I want you to pay keen attention and learn the concepts because they are going to be helpful for you when you do your exams all right or in general all right organic chemistry is a wonderful area and i want to encourage you on this part as we take this journey together all right so what are our objectives today so one we're going to be drawing structural isomers of alkenes two we're going to name straight chain and branch chain isomers of alkenes and lastly, we're going to complete practice problems by applying concepts that we would have learned in today's um, lesson. So let's look at again. Alkenes. Well, alkenes we know is represented by a general formula, CNH2N. In addition to that, we know alkenes contain a double bond between two carbon atoms. Their functional group is the carbon to carbon double bond as you would see in this diagram all right so these are some things that we would know about alkenes so once there's a double bond it's an alkene so we're going to look at some structural isomerism in alkenes now remember alkenes have a double bond between carbons and they have a general formula cnh2n all right, so let's draw some structures now of isomers. So let's look at the first one. So we're going to do some practice, and we're going to see whether or not um, alkenes that contain two carbons have structural isomerism. Now, in the last lesson, we would have learned that there are alkenes that cannot have, that do not have structural isomerism. Example, methane. An example, um, um, ethane as well. These are, these are organic compounds that do not have structural isomerism. Reason being, because there's only one complete structure and there's no difference in structure of, this particular com of these particular compounds. So let's see if alkenes adhere to the same thing also. All right, so let's look at the first one. So we are looking at, we are looking at this first one, C2H4. This is called um, ethene, all right, because two is et, and let's take a draw. So et would contain two carbons, and since we are dealing with an alkene, we know that there must be a double bond, just as we would have stated, a double bond must be present. 
and there are four hydrogens. So each carbon must have approximately, or what we say, they must have four bonds, because that's how much carbon can facilitate. So we have one, two, three, four bonds on each carbon. Then we have the hydrogens, which would be on these bonds connected to these carbons, and there we have it. So we have our first structure of ethene. Now the question is, is there any other way that I can draw ethene? Is there a different structure for it? The answer to that is no. So what we would observe is that there is only one compound that I can get from this molecular formula. So let us continue ahead. So we're going to erase here. Let's look at our next example. So the next one we have C386. Does this particular compound um, have um, an isomer, or does this particular compound um, consist of structural isomerism? And let's look at it. So we're going to put them out. So we have three carbons. So we put our carbon chain, all right? And we know that alkenes must have a double bond, so we place a double bond right here. So we're going to look at adding in the other bonds that we have. We want to make sure that all carbons have four bonds. And if you observe and you count each of them, you're going to realize that all carbons have four bonds. This is very important for you to do. When you are drawing your organic compounds, alkenes, alkenes, alcohols, alkanoic acids, whatever one, you have to ensure that your carbons have the amount of bonds that is necessary. So there are some cases where some students or anyone, sometimes if you make an error, and you may add a bond here because you're accustomed to seeing the carbon looking like this. But if you do that, you're going to be forming an error. All right? Because one, if we count the bonds, you're going to have one here, you're going to have two here, you're going to have three here, and you're going to have four here, and you're going to have five. And that in itself poses a problem Reason being because carbon cannot facilitate five bonds. So this bond should not be present. All right, so let's erase and let's continue on the part. Does C386, which is propene, does it have structural isomerism? Let's put our hydrogens in and let us figure out, find out whether or not this compound has structural isomerism. All right. Is there another way to draw it? You know, some students will say, yes, you can shift the double bond. So I'm just going to just move this across. By adding this double bond here, it's now going to make the compound different. As a result, I would have to erase these, this hydrogen. And of course, I would have to make an alteration to this one here and make it Now, what this is, this is actually the same thing that was before. So there's no difference. And you may not understand 100% now, but when we get into naming these compounds, you are going to see it very well. But in this case, it just seems like I would have just flipped the compound around. Remember, this side would have had the same CH3 um, one. In addition to that, um, we did have a middle that contained the CH connection, and we had an end which had CH2, all right? So which is carbon with connected to two hydrogens. So it's the same compound still. There is no difference, all right? So what we would learn is that there is also no structural isomerism with alkenes that have three carbons. All right, now let's look at C4H8. Let's see if we do have structural isomerism for this one here. So we have four carbons laid out. And of course, it must have a double bond. And we look at this. So I'm going to leave the hydrogens out because of time constraints. And then we're going to look at is if there is another way of drawing it. Now, what I advise all students to do when you are doing your isomers 
especially when you come to alkenes, your first step in drawing a different isomer, you move the double bond to the adjacent carbon. Why did I say that? Now, for alkenes, when we make a change in the structural isomer, we begin by taking off and making branches with the carbons that we have in the particular compound. Now, where alkenes are concerned, one of the first step in drawing an isomer, you move the double bond. This is going to help you to be able to see the different possibilities of the isomers that you would have. So let us, let us continue. So one, my next structure for this, because I know in, 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 in that, I know for detail that C4H8 does have another isomer. So I would shift the double bond to the second carbon. All right? And in shifting to the second carbon, I am now going to have a different structure. So let's draw them in. One. Is this a different structure? Yes. If we observe the ends, we can observe that this is a different structure. One, on this end, let me use a different color. On this end, we have a carbon that is connected to three hydrogens. All right? Let me see. And on the other end, so we do have a carbon here that is connected to three hydrogens. So, yes, they are similar. Okay? So, let's go ahead. There is a carbon on the next end that is connected to two hydrogens. All right? Whereas, on the next compound, there is a carbon connected to three hydrogens. For those who may be now tuning in, the reason why I'm saying hydrogens, I'm just drawing these. I'm, we are imagining that we have hydrogens here. So just to ensure that no one gets mislead by this, I'm going to put the hydrogens in. All right? So we can all follow clearly. All right? Now, where it is concerned, we observe a clear difference. One, because one end of the compound has three hydrogens connected to a carbon, and the other end of the compound has th three hydrogens connected to the carbon, which might be similar, but there's a difference on the, the end on, on the further end here. So we have one carbon connected to three hydrogens, and this one here, the carbon is connected to two hydrogens. So there's a clear distinction and a difference between the compounds. There's no similarities. So one way we can check to ensure that we do have isomers of C4H8. Are there any more? Yes, there, can, there are more that we can draw. So one, let's look at the next option. So our next option is from here is to go to branching. Why do we go to branching? If I move the double bond again, what is going to happen? I'm going to have the similar compound occurring again. So let me move the double bond again. So I'm going to leave this one, and I'm just going to just draw because I'm going to need that structure for later on. All right, so I'm going to draw a new structure to the bottom here. So we have one. So let's say... Okay, so we're gonna, we want to move the double bond again. I'm going to put it to this one on the end. Will it be an isomer? All right? So I'm not going to put any hydrogens in this one, but look at it carefully here now. Now we have a compound which has a carbon with end that is connected to two uh, hydrogens, and we have a next end that is connected to three hydrogens. Same as this one. This one is connected to two one end is connected to two, and the next one is connected to three. Let's go further. There's a carbon which is next to the one with two that is connected to one hydrogen. Same here. There's a next carbon which is next to that carbon or adjacent to that carbon, which is connected to two hydrogens, same as this one here. So it's the same compound again. All right? So shifting the double bond way down again to our next end, it's going to still be the same compound. When we get to naming, it's going to become more easy and clearer for you to see. 
So let's erase this one and let's see what other structural isomer we can get. Now, because we know from here now that we cannot get any more structural isomers by moving the double bond, what is our next bet? We need to start using what we see, branches. So I am going to select one of them and I'm going to select the first one that we had, the first one we draw, and I'm going to move. Eh? I'm going to move one of these groups and form a branch. So I am going to, I'm just going to show you which one I'm going to select by blue. I'm going to take out this portion and I'm going to form a branch. So let's see here now. So if I take this out, the compound is going to remain as C dash C double bond to AC, which is connected to two hydrogens. And I'm going to make it a branch. Now, when you are making a branch, I always advise my students as well to move the branch to the adjacent carbon that you remove the carbon from. So what do I mean by that? So we are going to remove this one. If we are removing this one, we can't go and put it back on the same carbon that it was bonded to in the first place. All right? So I can't remove this and then go and put it back on this carbon here because that's the carbon that it was connected to in the first place. So I, I must make a difference. I must connect it to a carbon that it was not connected to. And this is the one that I'm going to choose. All right? So let us begin. So I'm going to use a different color so we could show, show it clearly. And I am going to make my connections here. All right? So this is the the carbon that I, I moved, and we now have a, another structural isomer being formed from the compound C4H8. All right, so we're going to leave it there. That should be the amount of compounds that C4H8 can form the different um, isomers. However, at another level, there are more isomers that c 4 H8 can form. However, at this level, we are not going to be going into that depth. All right? So for now, we know that C4H8 is going to form three isomers. All right? So I'm going to erase this here now. And as I said, as we continue to go ahead and we learn to name these compounds, we are going to be able to identify whether or not they are isomers as we proceed in the lesson today. All right, and we have some nice practice problems that is going to help to cement these concepts that we would have learned today. So I want you to keep tuned in. We are almost through, all right? All right, so there are other compounds. You can practice these other two in your time, applying the concepts that I would have done here, and you would see how many isomers you can get. Always remember that when you are doing isomers, when you are drawing isomers for alkenes, begin first by moving the double bond among around the chain. When you are complete with that, eventually what you can do now is look out at branching so you can take off carbons you select them and you can start going into branching all right just as we would have done with alkenes all right so alkene isomers formed by branching what have we learned so some of the things that we have learned so far from the little exercise that we have is that alkenes with four or more carbon atoms show structural isomerism resulting from, one, a change in position of the carbon to carbon double bond. So I would have known that, all right? And I kept reiterating this, that you must move the double bond first. It's going to help you. It's going to assist you as you are going on, all right? In addition to that, we can also form structural isomerism from branching of the molecules, okay? So this is where we have alkenes. This is what we would have learned today. All right, let's continue. Named examples of I-alkene isomers. 
So we would have done C4H8. And I told you that the name, that naming these compounds are going to help us to further understand the difference between the structures. All right? So let's look. Look at this first one. So the first compound we have here, the second, we would have drawn all of these before in the, in the slide before, and uh, the third. So these are the three isomers that we say C4H8 can form. Now, the first one we call it but1ene, or we can refer to it as 1-butene. We're going to find out how we get that name afterwards. The next, we can call it but2ene or 2-butene. And lastly, the third one, we call it 2-methylpropene. We're going to look at how we can form or how we come about with these names, and you're going to learn how to do that today. All right, so stay tuned, and we're going to be getting into that right now. So naming isomers of straight-chain alkenes. So one of the first things that we need to know is we name a number, we name base on the number of carbons in the compound. So a while ago, you told, I told you if there's three carbons, we know that it's prop. So we call it propene since we're dealing with alkenes, all right? So we need to use the organic prefix in order to help us to naming these compounds. We add in at the ending to complete the name. In addition to that, when, three, when there are four or more carbon atoms in a chain, the location of the double bond is indicated by a number. So that's, that would have been shown in the example that we had before. Um, when we were looking at the names. So let's, let's take a look at what we would have learned here. So we say that we need to find out how many carbons they have. So we number the carbons. So we can number one, two, three, four. So there are four carbons, and when we have four, we call it butte. Okay? So one, next it says... And we also know that our ending is going to be in because we are dealing with an alkene. All right? So it says here in the second step that when there are four or more carbon atoms in a chain, the location of the double bond is indicated by a number. So we did put a number there. We put four. But what we're going to learn from here on afterwards is that when the double bond is present, we need to make sure that the double bond has the lowest possible number. So I'm not going to give the double bond four. I would prefer to give the double bond one. So example, I would prefer to do this number system. Instead of the first one that we did, I'm going to do it, I'm going to enable it one, two, three, four. So the name of this compound would have been but dash one dash in or you can call it 1-butene. All right? So this is how we can, we can apply this for all other alkenes, the same concept. And let's look. We have one more example on the same page, what we're going to be looking at. All right? So let me just erase this here. So the numbering system that we're going to prefer is the one underneath. One, two, three, four. Let's look at the next one. So we have an, another compound here. Um, we have four, so it's the same compound. We have four, well, not the same compound, but it has four um, carbons. It's an isomer of uh, uh, C4H8, all right? And we have four. Again, we said that we want to ensure that the double bond has the lowest possible number. So we want to have one, two, three, four. Sometimes we work this out, we do it, and you could count one, two, three, four. So it doesn't matter which direction that we count from, the double bond is always on the lowest number. So we keep the lowest number. So it's one, two. So two is the, next, the, the number we can have, and we could also do it in the same way, so it's two. So in this case, we're going to call this compound but two dash in, or we can call it to built in. All right? So I'm, I think that we should be clear here. So let's move on. We want to get on to the, the more juicy stuff. All right? So we're naming isomers of branch chains. 
branch chain alkenes. And you can notice that we have the third step. Because in naming branch chain alkenes, we still use the first two steps. However, we add something in. There's something very important that you must do when you are looking at branch chains. This is what? It says here, determine the longest chain. So we have to first determine the longest chain, just as we do with alkenes, you know. Begin counting carbons closest to the end with the C double bond. As I would have said earlier, that you would ensure that the carbon to carbon double bond has the lowest possible number. So what they are saying is that you start on the carbon closest to that double bond. Once you start on the carbon closest to the double bond, of course the double bond is going to carbon that has the double bond is going to have the lowest possible number. All right? So one, number in the location of the double bonds take precedence over the location of any substituents. When we're talking about sub substituents, we are talking about branches. So for example, one, we said first in line, we must locate the longest chain. And we must begin with the double bond. The double bond must be in that longest chain. If the double bond is not in the longest chain, then the double bond doesn't take precedence over the molecule. So what we, what we ensure that we do when we are naming we, our alkenes, that the double bond is going to take precedence. And we want to make sure that we have the lowest number. So I'm going to start with this carbon. This carbon, because this carbon has the double bond, and it's going to be the lowest one, which is one. So I can go one, two, and three, or I can make it straight, one, two, and three. So which is this? So this is very easy here, all right? So I'm going to keep it just like that, and I'm going to um, call this my longest chain. So my longest chain, now, what will I do? I will name the longest chain. And how do I name the longest chain? The same two principles or the same two steps that we would have looked at earlier. One, when you are naming these chains, you have to ensure that you count the carbons inside of them and you give it the name based on the number of carbons. So how many carbons do we have in this, the longest chain? We have one, we have one, two, and three. The number for three or the, the, uh, the organic prefix for three is prop. And since we are dealing with a double bond, we know that we add in because it's an alkene. So the name of this longest chain is going to be propene. All right? So that's step one. All right? In naming our branch chains. Are we finished? No, there is more. So let's proceed. Does it end there? There is more. All right, so we're looking at the next one, the fourth one. Name and number the location of each substituent, which is talking about the branch chains. The name of these substituents will be written before the main chain and will end with ill. All right, so example CH3 would be called methyl C2H5, and we're talking about C2H5 as we would have dealt with, we will be ethyl and C387 would be, and this is just condensed forms of how these particular branches would be written. And just to ensure that you understand, methyl, of course, would be a branch coming off of a compound. It would be a branch coming off of a compound that has a carbon with three hydrogens connected to it. That's why we call it C3H5, all right? C2H5, would be a branch coming off of a compound that consists of um, two carbons, okay? So I have a next carbon connected here, and we have them. So we have all the H's here connected. So why? that's why we call it C2H5. So it's just a condensed form of written, writing it because we have two carbons, one, two, and we have five hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five. All right? And of course, C3 would be just a branch coming off with three um, carbons um, in that chain. Of course, these carbons are going to have seven, seven hydrogens in total connected to each of them, um, connected to all of them in total, right? So 
let's see where we can apply this information even to the concept where we would have learned what we would have been doing in our slide before. So let's proceed. So we were looking at this compound here. This was a compound that we were looking at before. And what we would have concluded is that we would have a long chain and we found out that this was the long chain, the longest chain that we have. And we make sure that the longest chain had the double bond inside of it. And we would have named that longest chain propene. Now, what about the branch? What about this guy here? What are we going to do with him? How does he, because he needs to be included in the naming. So we circle him out. What did we learn? We learned that if there's a branch coming off of a long chain, and it has one carbon in it, we will call it a methyl. So this C3 is what we call a methyl branch. So knowing this, what, we did, what was it says? The name of the substituent will be written before the main chain. So this is the name of the main chain, of course. So the name of the substituent is going to come before propene. So I'm going to put methyl before pro um, propene. So it's going to be methyl propene. However, you need to make sure that you number the substituent. Name and number. So where, what is the number this substituent is on? We would have begin by doing our numbers one, two, because we need to make sure that the double bond has the lowest number, and three. And what we would learn here is that this group here, or this branch, is found on the second carbon. And because it is on the second carbon, we are now going to put that number in. So what we're going to do, as you can see in the corner here, we are going to call it 2-methylpropene. And notice that where we have the name, we have 2-methyl. So we always put a hyphen in between to separate words and numbers. So let's continue. So what else? And two or more side chains. So if we have two or more branches on, on a compound, what are we going to do? So if there are two or more um, branches, we use prefix di, tri, tetra, etc. to indicate when there are multiple side chains of the same type. So if they are the same type, then we are going to use these prefix. So what do we use? We use commas to separate the numbers from each other and hyphens to separate the numbers or from the letters. So let's have an example. So we're looking at a condensed formula of a compound. So let's name this compound. So the first step we need to do is to ensure that we find the longest chain. And in doing so, we need to make sure that this longest chain has, a, has the double bond in it. In addition to that, the double bond must have the lowest possible number. So we must start from, we must start numbering from a carbon close to the double bond, or if the carbon closest to the double bond is the carbon that has a double bond, then we are going to start here. So in this case, we have this carbon having the double bond. So we're going to start here. So let's see uh, what is the longest chain. So I'm going to draw a line. This is what I like to do sometimes through my compounds. One, two, three, four. Okay? So there's a straight line. I could have gone, um, let me use a different color. I could have gone one, two, three, four. And I could have gone up. Same, same um, concept. Okay? And if I did that... I would have had these here being my branches, all right? So let's do that, okay? Let's do that. Let's see if we can do that, right? Because it's going to be the same thing, all right? So this is my, my straight chain. So my numbering of this, of, my, of the longest chain here, is going to be 1, 2, 3, and 4, all right? So I have four carbons. So we said when we have the, num the, the, the number of the longest chain, we give it a name, all right? And since we are dealing with an alkene, we know that we end with ene, all right? We have four carbons on the longest chain, and four is butte. So this is going to be 
butene. In addition to that, we are not finished. We say that when we have four or more carbons, we need to number, we need to give a number to that double bond. All right? Where does this, what is the number of that double bond? All right? So one, we say that it is on the first carbon. So we look at the lowest number for the double bond. Remember, we always look at that, the carbon with the lowest number. So the carbon that is bonded to the, to the, that is on the double bond that has the lowest number is carbon number one. So we are going to call this one dash butene. So that's the name of our longest chain. The longest chain is called one butene, but we are not finished because they are branches. All right. So these branches are CH3 branches and we have two of them. Okay. So we have methyl branches as we said that these branches i will use a different color in this case and we separate and we said that these branches we need to name them and we need to number them so what number uh, uh, does these branches um are these branches on so we said one two three so this first one here is on the third carbon so we call that three methyl and this second one here is on the same third carbon, so it is also 3-methyl. All right, so we need to add that to the name. So what is the name of this compound? We learned that if we have two or more side chains or two or more branches from this rule, that we group them and we give them a prefix called di tri or tetra it's based on the number of branches that are the same now we have two branches that are the same the two branches that are the same are the metal branches so we have two metal branches so what would we do i'm just gonna leave this and make some space we're going to say dimethyl instead okay so we're going to say dimethyl why dimethyl? Because there are two methyl groups. All right? In addition to that, we need to add the numbers. These two are on carbon 3. So we need to put that number in front, which is 3. But it's not complete. There are two methyl groups on carbon 3. So we must put two numbers, which is 3, comma, 3 dimethyl. And some people say, sir, why? Why, why you cannot just call it 3-dimethyl? Three, three we, would, we would have understood that this methyl is on the third carbon. Well, I understand that. Yes, it makes sense. But this is a, what the reason for this, or one reason for it having these two numbers, is to ensure that you know that they are actually two connections. There are two different areas in which they are connected to this particular carbon. And in addition to that, you have situations where you have methyl groups that are connected to different numbers. So say for instance, if you had um, three methyls, just saying, three methyls connected to this compound, three methyl groups, three methyl branches, sorry. And one of the methyl branches on the second carbon what should I have? Two, three, trimethyl. All right, so I'm just going to look at it. Two, three. Just to illustrate the point. That's saying is if there was a methyl group connected here. All right. Okay, so then, if we have three methyl groups, which carbon is this third methyl group on? Is it the second? Or is it the third? By placing the numbers in, I can, so we set a standard from the get-go, so we don't have any problems later on. So we need to put those numbers in so that we wouldn't get thrown off when we get more difficult problems. So we keep a standard and we keep it that way so that we can always keep these habits 
so that we will also name the compound effectively. So you know exactly where it, this, this uh, methyl group is found. All right, so let's um, go ahead. So I'm gonna erase this. So, so far we know that the compound, its name is 3,3-dimethyl. And in addition to that, we add in the information 1-butene. All right, so the name of this compound, and we are complete there because we have account for everything. We account for the groups and we account for, so this name here, the name of this particular compound is called 3,3-dimethyl-1-butene. Okay, so let us tap ahead. So, alkene isomers formed by branching. So, we would have now understood why I would have called this compound but1-ene. You understand now? Reason being is because one, the, it's a long chain carbon, there's no branches, so it's very simple. The double bond is found on the first carbon. So, I would call it, and there are four carbons, I call it but1-ene or 1-butene. Next, I call this one 2-butene because the double bond is on the second carbon, all right? And we also have four carbons present in the molecule, so we call it um, but2-ene or 2-butene. And lastly, we have one with the branch where we'll call it 2-methylpropane or 2-methylpropane. Why? We would have found the longest chain. We would have numbered them. We found out that there's a methyl group present, and this methyl group is on the second carbon, so we call it 2-methylpropane. All right? And that's where it, propane being the longest chain that we would have circled.